Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting to order. The finance? I'm sorry, Oops. the um, personnel meeting. It's That's uh, Ron Steele. <laughs> <clears throat> Courtesy of the floor for the personnel committee. Seeing none. none. Review of the county executive's appointments and reappointments. The first one is um, um, appointment for Area Agency on Aging Board, Anne Marie Pinella. Do I have to make a motion to accept? Uh, yes. Uh, motion her resume is attached. Accept. Okay. Okay. Yes, and I would like to, uh, okay, so moved. Also, I'd like to address the fact that uh, Mr. Kraft is, is uh, Mr. Warner is replacing Mr. Kraft on the Personnel Committee, and, and he is here tonight, and we also have a uh, full agenda tonight. Okay, next up is the Open Space Advisory Board, a reappointment um, for Paul um, Riccardi of Bethlehem is being considered for a two-year term beginning August 1st, 2018 to end March 18th, 2020. So moved. So moved. Want to throw a second out there? Two for open space. Okay, and also uh, we'll do them together. And then also uh, for open space, it's an appointment, not a reappointment, but an appointment for Clyde Thomas of Bethlehem. Mr. Thomas is being considered for a two-year term to begin August 21st, 2018 and end March 18th, 2020. Can, and his, uh, his um, resume is attached for Mr. Clyde Thomas. You have to look up. Oh, second. Okay, do we, have, do we have a motion and a second? Okay, great, so moved. Great, thank you. I missed that movement. Okay, uh, next, next is the review of personnel requests. Uh, Department of Human Resources um, for Health Choices. At the request of Suzanne Wondolowski, Department of Human Resources, please consider the following request uh, for the creation of an MH Program Specialist One position. And attached, you will find the calculations of the financial impact of this request. And here is Ms. Wondolowski at the mic. Do we discuss this already or no? Oh, okay. I was human say, services, I was not resources. Say I don't want human resources. I Thank apologize. You. <laughs> no apology needed. Human I'm guessing, services. I'm guessing my uh, 13 requests last month pushed Mr. Kraft over the edge, so <laughs> he bailed on us. <laughs> but, <laughs> This one's uh, short and sweet. Um, our health choices program, the oversight and monitoring, health choices, does everybody, it's uh, our managed care system. We over work with Magellan for our uh, medical assistance folks. Um, and we have one program specialist who essentially it's a quality assurance position. And uh, previously we had a consultant who helped with this, but she is no longer available to do so. So we have one program specialist who uh, attempts to tackle it all, and while she does a, a very good job, she cannot possibly keep up with the volume. Uh, and, th and now with the, the additional requirements of monitoring and oversight by the state, uh, or for the state, we are in need of another position. The good news is this costs the county zero dollars um, because it is all, it is fully funded with the uh, Health Choices Capitation Budget. Any questions? Just uh, one quick one. Did you attempt to uh, find another consultant to fulfill the duties that the previous one was doing before you um, decided to create another position? I don't think so. Oh, sorry, Deb. Gordon was in charge. Yeah, really. <laughs> I am Deb Nunes. Hi, Deb. Um, Hi. We did not try to go out and get another consultant because time is of essence. And the one that we had served us all the way up until June. So I didn't really have all that much time. But with the requirements that the PSNR's program standards and requirements are given to us from the state, there's going to be a lot more audits. There might be an inclusion in the next year or two about the uh, community health choices with the aging program. 
Um, they've changed a lot of our appendices for grievances and hearings and complaints. And one person doing it all, if she gets hit by a bus, I don't have anybody to replace her. So I'm hoping that with the second program specialist would take half of the load off of her and be also able to dedicate some time to reinvestment and things that I could use a little bit more help with. So that would make a grand total of four staff that I would have. Okay, well, we'll try to tell Lanta to be more careful. Oh. <laughs> her, don't get me started. Are you on the porch? <laughs> yes, is this also the program in the future that's going to be taking over the Graystale? Is Health Choices community, part of that? Community, community health, health. health. All right, so that's different. We might be in tandem with that, but we're not going to be at that. In terms of monitoring that? However the state decides in their grand wisdom to do that. Yeah. So that's coming in, what, like two years? Two years, probably? yeah. It's getting piloted right now down the southeast, and they're working out all the bugs. Mm. So, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, including yourself now, uh, the, the, the program director, who, what are the two other positions that currently exist? I have Susie Temples, who fills the accountant position that does all the fiscal and financial stuff for us. Yeah. I have Rich Lieberman, who fills the IT, uh, does all the claims and all the data and all so the Rich run. Rich is still there. Rich is still there. Tisbeen Musa is my quality manager for the for right now, and then I had a clerical position as well, which is not filled either. So all right. So what you're saying then is, is that. Uh, what the, the consultant did, this, this new position, the, what your um, quality assurance person is, is more than enough oh, work yes. for the two people. Oh, yes. The um, consultant basically did the audits because she had a nursing background yeah. and did some stuff here for the county. Okay. I just, so you still, is, I know Rich Lieberman is like a computer whiz. I don't know if people He's a know genius and he's history. mine. He worked for <laughs> He worked for a computer yours. company, and I, we, we stole him from the computer company. Um, does, do you still borrow him unofficially for, for different things? Uh, as little as possible, because what we have done, it, he, Rich is still invaluable in that capacity, but um, once I started, we really worked with Conduent to come up with an appropriate system, yeah. because Rich does have a full-time job for Deb. Yeah. Uh, that does not involve fixing everybody else's IT problems, and we're paying a lot of money for Conduent to do that. So it really was not very hard to do, and most people are on board with that. And when we need something immediately, yeah. and no one from Conduent is around, Rich is like the last the last resort guy. Well, he's, I mean, he, I'm just throwing this in, because using our staff and utilizing them, I'm not, don't take him away from what he's doing, right. but I know Rich, uh, his background, he was always good uh, when the company would tell us you need to do this, you need to buy that, uh, I would. I, 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 I uh, uh, used him mercilessly uh, <laughs> to, to tell me, am I being, are these guys, do we really need this? He was always good at being able to tell you the software isn't all it's cracked up to be in that. Now, he still does, he yeah. still does that. But, we have not and he does tell me that it was your fault, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, okay, so that, I just was curious about the, the structure as it stands now. So this would be, would be two uh, quality assurance people, program specialist ones. Yes. But you still say you need a, so who's doing the clerical? We've kind of absorbed most of those duties because I've basically not had one more than I've had one. Okay. Um, but like I said, I have not decided or we haven't talked about what's to come of that position if we're going to change that down the road or right. right now I'm saving money on the salary uh, where are we because I know this is a lot of work Magellan's is, is that come is, have you just contracted I know we're still with Magellan right yes, yes. Uh, is that coming up soon for a renewal that's done oh it's done yeah it's an amendment actually oh okay that's all I had to thank you thanks anyone else ready to make the motion to push this forward to tomorrow okay, okay. Second. all right Motion and second to push it forward. Okay. So moved. Thank you for your time and, and uh, your information. Absolutely. And for staying ahead of the curve. Yeah, bottom because line we have is no, to. no county dollars. So uh, that's the good news. And think up your questions for Deb tomorrow because she will be back for the Human Services Committee where you can ask her all sorts yeah. of health choices questions. So we have to make it worth her worth her trip back. No problem. <laughs> sure, we'll come up with a 
I'll ask her to tell stories about you. Okay, uh, next up, uh, the Department of Corrections at the request of James Castor, Director of Corrections. Please consider the following request to eliminate the position of professional, responsibili professional responsibilities investigator full-time and create the position of corrections supervisor full-time. Um, eliminate the following positions, create the following positions. Attached is a calculation of the financial impact of this request, which is zero. And Mr. Kostor is at the mic, if you would like to address any questions that the committee may have. This is for, you. This is for the dog. That's correct. That's just the title change? It's a, it's a position change. We have a, an investigator that we, we find our needs better for a shift supervisor for this. Yes, we move it forward. Second. Okay. Well, any questions? Move it forward. First, uh, as so moved. Thank you. All right. With nothing else, I guess uh, it calls for adjournment. So moved. For the um, personnel committee meeting. Good. All right. I guess we're 12 minutes. 12 minutes. I don't think Wait till Kenny hears that. There yeah. you go. Because he wasn't here. <laughs> He's probably watching. <laughs> Make this five minutes and really tick him off. <laughs> Who's counting? Hey. Functional and get the job done. So. Is that the, that's the lady? Okay. Well, I guess. Um, Choice. Let's uh, call the Finance Committee meeting to order. Uh, courtesy of the floor. Anyone who wants to speak, seeing no one. We, uh, we're going to have a presentation by RKL, and I believe we have representatives here. No, Bob. They wanna... They're, you're welcome to come up. Uh, I don't know if... Um, Mr. Barron's going to be cheering you on or adding things. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess I mean they'll explain themselves, but they're the their auditors. They're gonna tell us the good news and all the other news. Whenever you're ready, you can just uh, go ahead. Good. Thank you uh, for the invitation to present the uh, results of the 2017 financial statement audit. Uh, Jill and myself are with RKL, the outside audit firm, CPA firm. I'm Nick Hafel. I'm the audit manager on the account. Um, and Jill is, Jill Gilbert is the partner uh, on the account. So what I'd like to review uh, with the committee today is a presentation we put together that includes um, some required communication elements, things that we saw and look through when we are here to do the audit procedures and then also review uh, some information from the actual uh, financial statements just to go over for for council's interest seems like I lost my feed
Sorry about that. We do have. We'll, we'll try to get through the press, try to get through the presentation before I lose it again. So what I handed out in the spiral bound book is the presentation, all the slides uh, to review with you. Um, so you can follow along in that or on the screens as well. So just firm team and contacts. I mentioned myself, uh, Nick Hayful, the audit manager, and Jill Gilbert. Just contact information in case council or the or the board has any questions and would like to get back to us. Uh, we went through last year a bit of a firm uh, introduction for ourselves, but uh, we're a regional firm in, in basically in Pennsylvania, 400 team members strong, uh, brick and mortar offices in Lancaster, Reading, York, Harrisburg, uh, Mechanicsburg, and we just opened up in Exton. We have some remote uh, workers uh, in other places around the country as well, but we have pretty deep roots uh, in the public sector work, uh, over 80 governmental uh, clients, including uh, counties like yourselves, municipalities, authorities, uh, and the like. Uh, pretty heavily involved with the industry groups as well. So what I'll review with you is just walking through a little bit of the audit process in terms of what we do as the external auditors. Certainly internally you have a, a dedicated internal audit function through the controller's office. They set their audit plan for the year and have their auditors working uh, on specific audits um, according to their plan. What we do on an annual basis is come in work with the controller's office and, and through fiscal mostly for the accounting records, um, go through, get an understanding of uh, what is new, what's changed, and what's going on with the county uh, for the year under audit. We'll go through in, uh, in a risk assessment process to look at internal controls, checks and balances that are in place in areas that we want to focus our, our work for the audit procedures. That typically happens in late in the year, December, January time frame, uh, as the year is wrapping up. Field work, when we're out here performing the audit procedures, we have a uh, team on site, uh, usually for about three to four weeks performing procedures, uh, going through historical transactions, uh, interviews with folks, uh, and doing our audit testing. That's conducted between March and April, typically, uh, on the calendar. And then we go through a financial reporting phase where we review the financial statements that are put together by the fiscal office. Uh, the financial statement itself, the general purpose financial statement, um, is about 80, uh, 94 pages long. That is completely and entirely put together by the fiscal staff here. It's their information. It's just our report and our opinion on the financial statement. So of that whole document, our piece is about two to three pages of it for the opinion to explain what we saw and what we think of it, and the rest is prepared internally by management. So on a typical reporting year, uh, the county charter has us issue that financial statement by the end of April, which is the deadline. We had some holdups this year related to some changes that the county uh, went through related to some uh, reporting entity changes. I'll talk about those in just a minute. So those were delayed from the typical timeline. Those financial statements were issued June 28th, um, 2018, which is our audit report date. Every year, um, for many years running, the county has submitted its financial statements, a bigger reporting package, to the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, for its certificate uh, of how um, complete and accurate the financial statements are. Typically that's due by the end of June. A one-month extension was granted for this year due to extenuating circumstances and getting all the information together. So we were able to get that, what we call the CAFR, that larger report in on time um, to be submitted and considered for the certificate. So backing up just a little bit, when we come out to take a look at the audit process overall, the significant areas and procedures that we look at for the county's audit, um, we look at the control environment, the checks and balances in place, and that's kind of who's handling transactions, receipts, disbursements, reconciling bank statements, um, those sorts of policies and procedures. So we go through and we test those controls that are in place to see if the design is working effectively as expected. We look at revenue recognition, the timing of real estate taxes, grant revenues, um, service charges at the Graysdale Nursing Home. Look at those from a measurement perspective to see if they're in the right period. The county has a significant amount of cash and investments. So the cash is confirmed with the counterparties. We go to the banks and confirm that those accounts are there and the, and the amounts that are expected. Same for the investment side, um, whether it's the uh, pension or the OPEB 
trust funds that are maintained. We confirm those and do testing on those to see that the value is as reported in the financial statements. Other areas that we look at are cut off of liabilities, make sure liabilities and expenses end up in the right period where they're supposed to. The retirement pension and the OPEB plans have become a more significant focus of the audit over the past few years, and we'll talk a little bit about the reporting changes for those. So we spend time looking through census records to make sure those who are eligible for the p plan are participating in the plan. Allocations are being done the way they're supposed to, and distributions are making their way out to beneficiaries um, at the prescribed amounts. We also review estimates as part of the financial statement. The financial statement itself is comprised of a lot of historical transactions that came and went um, in the form of cash receipts and disbursements. There's also some estimates that uh, need to be made each year in terms of what we think the liability might be for the pension plan in the future, what we think the, um, the liability might be for the OPEB, and if there's going to be any receivables that we're not going to get. So those sorts of estimates are part of the audit as well. In this closeout phase of the audit, what we'd like to do is tell um, the committee and council um, some required communication elements at the conclusion of our audit if we had any significant matters that came to concern that you should know about as those charged with governance over the entity. So as I mentioned before, our report under our professional standards for the financial statement was issued in June, late in June. And the CAFR, as I mentioned, that larger report was issued July 24. Uh, and mailed into to GFOA for the, as John Cusick has for us, um, and mailed into the, um, the GFOA for them to score and they'll, they'll write comments back if they have any. Uh, the communication, uh, plan scope and timing of the, of the audit we send out in just a form letter, so we got that out early in January. For the t 2017 audit, we had no audit adjustments that were recorded in the county's financial statements. In the normal course of closing out as many funds as the county has, it happens that there's entries that are brought back into the accounting period, but no material or significant items that were identified as a product of our testing uh, had to be made. So the, the books and records were closed um, as, as they were to be. We had no uncorrected misstatements. Sometimes we come across adjustments or uh, measurements that aren't just what the accounting uh, rec or, uh, accounting rules would have us follow and management's taken a separate path. We don't have any of those items where we have any differences that are unrecorded or unreflected in the financial statements. At the conclusion of the audit, we report internal control findings and a management letter that we have. I have some uh, printouts of those um, that we'll distribute to council of our closing um, communication. We have a few minor recommendation in terms of uh, items we noticed in the conduct of testing for um, participant files for the pension plan, nothing that's overly pervasive or significant. The one thing that's new and I do want to highlight for the 2017 report is that we're communicating an item in there that we're classifying as a material weakness and that's a specific grade of, of kind of severity of, of an uh, internal control issue over accounting. Now, that wasn't presented last year, and there's a reason for that. Um, this, in this year's financial statements, the county was required to bring into its core financial statements the Northampton County General Purpose Authority, the GPA, in a way that it hadn't reported or showed that in the past. The GPA has a completely different, separately governed board and management structure, and it doesn't follow the county's kind of usual internal control processes. Um, and there's very few staff that handle the transactions and they have an outside audit firm that looks at their information as well. Due to the small size of that, that staff, we uh, have considered and the component auditor considered that they didn't have what we call segregation of duties. They just don't have checks and balances over all their transactions due to the small size. So that, has, that is something that has been reported to the GPA in prior years. Because of the GPA is now part of the county reporting unit, we have to communicate that through our formal letter. Throughout the audit process, we encountered no disagreements with management uh, or council uh, over the application of accounting policies or elections or just how transactions are, are, um, are accounted for. We're not aware of any consultation that management had uh, with any outside accountants or, or uh, auditing firms related to our subject matter. And we do have that management letter with the internal control findings that we issued uh, just August 13th. Um, for council to review.
Can I stop you before you move ahead? Could you define what a component unit is and why the GPA is now a component unit? Sure. Um, and it relates to, you'll notice in the financial statements, there's a series of, of what we call um, re restatements to basically to the equity position of the county. One of those relates to that change in reporting unit. So a component unit is an entity that's kind of probably separately governed, but has some relationship to the county in terms of if you appoint its board members, approve its budget, or provide significant financial support to the entity. So there's, in the, in the world of, of accounting, for those entities, it could either be discreetly presented, and that's how the GPA has been handled in the past. It's put on your financial statements. It was there, but it was in a separate column on its own, kind of out to the edge. And that's because the county didn't, you had uh, influence over the entity, but you didn't really have control over it uh, under the accounting rules. In 2017, what changed was the execution of the P3 bridge rehabilitation program. And via that contract, the county guaranteed um, performance on the contract payments and essentially what will become the debt in future years that the GPA will pay to the contractors under the P3 uh, agreement. So under the accounting rules, when that happens, when you guarantee someone else's debt, you have to sweep them in as part of your core reporting unit. So. It's a, it's a bit of a technicality for the reason that it changed. So, so what you're saying, I mean, so I understand. Um, if, so it's really a point that the county, once the P3 project, and once the county is putting its full faith and credit and obligating its, because they are obligated to an, uh, an action by an authority, which the GPA in this case, mm -hmm. then by law, or by the accounting principles when you're doing the county They would still, do they still, are they still obligated to do, or should they be still be doing their own independent audit? So, so they're getting audited and basically then through themselves, but because we have, and it's just because we find we are now have taxpayer mm -hmm. dollars in this, that's why we must also include that component of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a separately governed organization, they have their own articles of incorporation and board that oversees their activity. So they have the prerogative to have a financial statement audit done for themselves and likely will continue to do so because of the size of the contract and the extent of the, the funds that are going to be extended with that. Um, from the county side, because you've basically guaranteed performance of those future payments, you have to fold it in and kind of consider it like it was one of your own funds yeah, um, in the financials. I really understand just going forward. Like Mm -hmm. and, and now that we, we're going to, I mean, we should, based on what you're saying, do this. Uh, when I see if I get a report from them, and this is our fiscal committee or audit, and I get it from the county, which one I want to put more weight behind, particularly if they disagree. Mm -hmm. And you, you more or less answered that question for me. So that's all I have. Yeah, and, and thank you. And if I could just follow up. So now that we know a, what a component unit is and why it, it became one, um, you also just mentioned the, the lack of segregation of duties. Um, could you specify what exactly happened there and, and what we're doing in the future? Or maybe Mr. Barron can tell us what we're doing in the future to pre prevent that from happening. Yeah, I, I can characterize that a little bit. We work with the component auditor, which is Riley and Company, which is a separate audit firm. Um, we rely on their uh, audit opinion in our financial statements. So, Riley does their opinion on that, and we kind of bring it in on board for the county. Um, whether that relationship continues in the future, if the GPA keeps its books separately, or if that gets brought in and internally managed at the county, will be a decision for management to make and, and possibly go through those discussions. But that segregation of, ish, uh, excuse me, segregation of duties comment is something that has been communicated um, for many years running by Riley and Company to the GPA. So that's kind of been an, a systemic thing because they basically have one individual who's keeping, kind of keeping count of the, uh, the bank account 
the bank statement, receipts, disbursements, and while they had relatively limited activity going through the GPA, the conditions still existed, but certainly in the future they're going to be um, very uh, broadly changing kind of the, the core of the GPA's activity. So um, that'll be a decision and a discussion, I assume, for, for fiscal um, and probably the boards to, to talk about in the future if that can be resolved through other checks and balances or if, you know, management of, of their accounting records could be brought to the county or to someone else to, to mitigate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, just an update, what we've talked about so far has to do with really the, the numbers in the historical financial statement. Our audit also includes an uh, audit over uh, compliance, the use of federal and state funds, if those were used appropriately within the stream of funding that they were received. So each year we uh, are required to look through and select a number of federal and state programs to do detailed testing. That uh, work has been started and it will be completed by the statutory deadline, which is September 30th. Um, so this is just a sneak peek at what programs were looked at uh, for what we call the single audit or the compliance audit this year. So just a few uh, talking points that I put in the slides for the actual financial statements themselves. There's a few graphs in here that give you a visual relationship of some of the balances. But I just wanted to highlight in the financial statements, I mentioned the word restatement earlier. Um, and if you have the financial statements handy or want to reference them later, um, note 15, page 70 of the financial statements gives a, a, a pretty straightforward presentation of what all the changes were. So in 2017, I had mentioned before that the county had to pick up the GPA as a what we call blended component unit and fold that into the primary county itself. So what we do is pick up the GPA's starting equity position. We have to bring that in on day one. Um, we also had some changes in 2017 related to pension actuarial measurements that are done by an outside firm, uh, the firm uh, Corn Ferry Hay Group. Uh, as they were formerly known, uh, does the uh, actuarial calculations and presentation of those amounts. There are some changes in the way they were handling the math and background for that that resulted in a change in opening, change in opening net position of about $11 million, 700. That was a pickup, so it increased net position and decreased the liability. That change in reporting entity that's on the slide of $1.8 million was related to bringing the GPA on board as of the start of the year related to that change in the contractual relationship. And there was also a change in how the county is treating some advances that were made in prior years to the GPA. It's a kind of separate and apart issue from, from just the P3 contract, but some advances that were made for some re revolving loan funds that total $1.25 million that the county now considers receivable from them and not a grant uh, award to the GPA. So all those kind of characterize some opening balance changes and how the equity position of the county changed uh, from the prior year um, for implementation of those. The other big change that you'll notice kind of is on the heels of this. Uh, in the county's primary financial statements themselves, the, the governmental funds balance sheet where you'll see the general fund and children and youth and, and gr the Graysdale fund, you're now going to see a fund listed there on uh, page. 71. What I want to point you to is probably page 20. Excuse me. Page 20 and 21 of the financial statements where you see that column presentation, there's now a column for the GPA fund um, kind of just sitting there alongside all the other county funds. And that just reflects picking up and reporting that in the core piece of the county's financial statement. Okay. Please. Uh, if I may, I just want to ask you, and you may cover this, so that's fine, or it may not even be relevant. Um, I know the P3 project, this is new for the county, a, a new relationship with an authority in that sense. Um, are we, uh, even though it's, it's the way it's structured, we're paying as we go, does the overall contract, if you will, for the bridge through the GPA, is that any way connected to our indebtedness as you look at the numbers? In other words, we are obligated as a county to 
expend X amount of dollars going forward over X amount of years. Is that something you're accounting for in a, in a way that's year to year or I, in a separate function from looking at the county's overall indebtedness? Yeah, what will happen with the contract as it continues is the way the contract is written at, from, the, the, from the P3 side, and this is the GPA's contract yeah. that the county's guaranteed, <clears throat> there's a, a series of milestone payments that the, the GPA has committed to pay and that the county will be cash flowing for the GPA when due. Um, there'll come a time when the work that's done on the actual bridge project They'll, the work will be done before the payments are scheduled to go to the contractor um, per that schedule. So there'll come a time when there is an element of debt that's extended there and there'll be interest imputed in that as well because you're gonna have the work done in probably the first four years or so I believe with the payment schedule extending about 10 years. So it's gonna take a little bit of time to, to get all those payments out. So there will be some debt that shows up. It doesn't in the early stages because they're just beginning the so work. We're gonna see some of this going forward with our audits. There's gonna be some, and I'm just- there's gonna, be, there's gonna be some debt that's recognized because you need to get all those costs in before the cash actually goes. Because going forward, I'm just wondering, I know when it goes that we looking at bond issues or something, we're looking at a level of debt, indebtedness, mm -hmm. how this, GPA project, because this is something new, I'm, I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with, with this type of arrangement, how that might impact us going forward. Yeah, there's very specific rules over that, the Local Government Unit Debt yeah. Act, and off the top of my head, I don't know how it's treated, but I don't know if Steve would like it. So, in my previous role as controller, I used to do the statement of indebtedness for the county. So, in looking at the debt, it will not be a huge material amount, because after four years, we will have probably paid almost half of the milestone payments. So, it's going to be a very, very small amount of debt. Currently, of our total borrowing capacity, the county is approximately at 7%, which means we could borrow hundreds upon millions of dollars more. Um, we're not doing that. Um, so we are at about 7% of you know, our borrowing capacity. So we're not anywhere, it's not gonna break the bank. Um, and as long as we keep making those milestone payments, it'll almost be a fiction on paper. Um, for, for the county. I don't want to take you off your game. No, so much. Yeah. Said, this That's is, a very good question. This is a new, a, a new road, mm -hmm. if you will. And <coughs> I, I just want to understand the financials going forward when I'm looking at this. I, I know it's a separate entity, yet we are directly tied into it. I'm sorry, uh, please continue. No, yeah, very good question. And that, it kind of oh, takes. I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, yeah, please. Just real quick, I just, before you start, I just. On page 20 of the financial, I, you had said the DB, there's a DB line item or something? Uh, on, on page 21? 21. You'll see a separate column now presented for the general purpose authority. No. And when we talk about the, that component unit being shown within the county's operations, that's what we mean. We now put them in as their own column okay. alongside Thank the rest of your Thank funds. you. Mm -hmm. I found it. A question. Is there any other entity in the county that operates in the same way or do you audit the same way as the general purpose authority or is it unique unto itself? No, and just to stipulate, we're not the auditor for the GPA, but there's no other activities that are handled in the same way. The, okay. the county has all sorts of different types of funds, but they generally all run through the internal, established internal fiscal management process um, at the county level. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So speaking of liabilities and how they might be seen in the future takes me to uh, the next talking point that we wanted to review. We have a few uh, slides in here that show some graphical uh, relationships between balances from 2016 to 2017 in terms of the county's total assets and liabilities and your net position, which is the equity position. So what I'd like to do is just take a couple minutes on this, on this slide. And if you have the financial statements uh, available, if you look at um, page 17 of the financial statements, that shows the statement of net position for the county overall, and that's inclusive of all the county activities and funds, excluding things like the retirement trust and the OPEB trust, but it's basically an all-inclusive image of, of the county itself and the GPA now that the county has included. 
So in this single column that you see presented on page 17 for governmental activities, what you'll see there is um, familiar items like the cash and accounts receivable due from other governments. We also include elements in this presentation that aren't seen further back in the report. Long-term assets and liabilities like the county's investment in property, plant, and equipment, capital assets. Um, also the county's long-term obligations, um, things like debt, capital leases, um, and um, sorry, the county doesn't have capital leases in the books. The, the debt, um, compensated absences, um, self-insurance uh, claims that would be due in future periods. So that gives a longer term view of the county's financial position that's a little bit different from the budgetary basis um, that is probably a little more familiar to, to folks that work with the budget. That's more on a cash flow basis, what receipts are expected, what expenditures and disbursements are expected. This gives a full, what we call the accrual basis of accounting, kind of a full picture in total of, of what the county owns, owes, and retains at the end of the year. I'll point out that the county's total net position at the end of 2017 was 123 million uh, 258. So that includes all of the county's owned assets, less all those liabilities that I mentioned, long-term debt, the pension obligation, compensated absences, um, forecasted claims on self-insurance. Um, what it doesn't include for 2017 is the county's total OPEB uh, liability uh, as of 2017. The accounting rules for the OPEB itself, and that's the healthcare, retiree health care plan, the accounting rules for that are changing over 2017 and 2018, and it's going to have a similar effect that the pension rules did in the last few years in that we're going to bring that total liability, um, or excuse me, the, the, net, the net OPEB liability, we're going to bring that on the balance sheet and that's going to be shown as a liability uh, on, on the balance sheet. Um, so just to, to kind of draw that out, we'll look at the county's total net position of the 123 million. Of that, various pieces of that are tied up in your, your, inf your infrastructure, your capital assets, so they're in kind of a non-spendable component. Other components of that equity are restricted for certain purposes. So your unrestricted net position, your kind of uh, available resources that aren't committed, would be the 24 million 658. Next year, we're going to pick up the net OPEB liability, and I'll take you back to uh, 76. Page, thank you. Page 76 of the financial statements, which now it's in disclosure format, but in the future, um, that's going to be presented as uh, a liability. Um, I'm sorry, did you say? Seven? It's on page 76. I think it's 53 million. Yes. Yeah, so in the back of the financial statements and the footnote disclosure, there's a lot of, lot of uh, language that was added and explanatory material required this year, but currently the county's net OPEB liability at the end of 2017 was 53 million. So... Excuse me, it's page 74. <coughs> I have the OPEB liability. It may depend if you're... May depend if you're looking at the CAFR or the. I'm I'm looking at this. Oh, if you have the ca CAFR, it might be a different page. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in those disclosures, we talk about the 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 net OPEP liability. That's what the actuaries think the total cost of liquidating those claims in the future will be, and also offset against your investment portfolio because you do have a trust fund that's set up um, to uh, hold investments, get a, a rate of return and to, to pay those in the future. So at the end of 2017, that net liability was uh, 53 million. So had that been picked up uh, in 2017, which we weren't yet required to do because they're phasing it in, the unrestricted net position of the county would actually have flipped to a negative position of, of about 30 million. So in that number can change. It may not be 53 million next year. It's subject to to experience under the plan and, and experience in the in the markets as well. So we'll see that where that takes us, but just to visualize a little bit what that liability will do um, in the future for the county. The county of Northampton is not alone uh, in this uh, in this OPEB status. There are, not every county has an OPEB, <coughs> but those that do are largely underfunded or they may be unfunded completely. So further on, just to, for illustration, 
Um, I do have a slide in here where we pulled Northampton counties, uh, the status of your, <clears throat> of your OPEB at the end of 2017 in a table format. Your total, what the actuaries think is the total liability was 92.5 million. Your assets offsetting that were 39.5 million. So your net liability was about 53 million. Oh, I'm sorry. What slide is that? It's I, I know. It's just a couple of pages. Yeah, it's way yeah, back. It's a, it's All right. So <coughs> it's two pages back. Sorry about that. So it's real near the end. The OPEB fund balance. Yeah, it's closer to the end. They're not. Yeah, there we go. The Status the and sensitivity. One, it has a blue band on it. Yep. There you go. All right, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Yes, thank you. And, and just for illustrative purposes, where the county stands was that net OPEB liability of the 53 million at the end of 2017. We pulled some figures for comparable counties that do have OPEBs. Uh, so we have two comparison counties in terms of their total operating budget, uh, kind of similar in scope and size to Northampton, what their total liability was, if they had any assets set aside for the OPEB plan, and what their net liability is. So you can just kind of see comparatively um, you're not alone <laughs> in this, uh, what the you know, accounting standards and the math will do uh, to the net statement of net position next year. Um, you'll notice county, comparative county number one has a very sizable uh, liability and also because of that they don't have any, because of the fact they don't have any assets set aside, they're afforded a very low discount rate so that actually expands the liability quite a bit um, in the projection of it. So the county's prior practice of making those annual contributions that the actuaries have suggested that you put into the plan have definitely strengthened your position in this. There is a liability and there's a liability for the pension as well, um, but the prior discipline and kind of setting uh, funds aside for those rather than just paying claims as they come up uh, is going to substantially lower that, that uh, forecasted liability because of your ability to uh, get earnings on the invested funds. If I could just point out to the, the new folks here, this <coughs> is a program that we ended uh, in 2010. Uh, so that should uh, additionally reduce our liability moving forward, am I correct? Yeah, you're correct. And the earlier that these plans are, are truncated or terminated for new entrants, that kind of stems the growth of the liability. It's certainly subject to health care trends and what the market is going to do for your investments. And on the same slide, you'll see the two uh, lines that are shown below is what they call a sensitivity analysis. And that is the numbers that are in the report aren't necessarily factual because an actuary has to use their approved math to calculate those and the future results could be different. What happens with the discount rate is that's your assumed long-term rate of return on your assets, which over time has been shown to be about 7.5% is the assumption they use. If it's lower than that, you'll see the liability is larger by about $12 million. And if you do better than that uh, on the long term, uh, your liability would be low, lower by $11 million. The other significant piece to that is not only your investment return, but also what health care cost rates do in the future, which can <coughs> be very volatile and uh, significant to the plan. So what the required disclosure is to say, if we have 1% worse or better performance, what's it going to do to the liability in a pro forma kind of way? So that, again, you'll see the same trend if those health care costs um, decrease, the expansion of health care costs decrease, your liability drops by 13 million, or if that costs increase in the future um, beyond what your assumptions are, it could increase the liability. So just a, a little kind of behind the scenes of the actuary world what if um, calculation for, uh, for their math. Status and sensitivity. Does that take into account any actuarial tables on, for example, the health care, the uh, uh, um, mortality rate, and, and, and that? I mean, since, yes, 2010 was cut off. And mm -hmm. We'll get to a point, I guess, that are we vested in 10, are people vested in 10 years? I don't know if we've done that before. Five. 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 All right, so basically, we're looking at anybody being hired. No, I don't want to try to do the math in my head now. Yeah. You guys can't take the math. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is so, so that is taken into, an, into account going forward. I know there's a lot of discussion I've, I've heard from different people about um, uh, 
uh, our pension or our health care fund for retirees um, as almost like a fixed unit. I know you have to look at it dollars and cents, but since that has passed in 2010, it's, I think, it, I'm assuming it, it's a little easier using the actuarial tables and mortality rates to get a handle on what we may be looking at. Yeah. And the, any one incident could throw that off, I get it. Yeah, the actuaries update that their views on- It is a volatile on, market. So yeah, on yeah. that. They, the pension they do annually, they do a study and they'll do a valuation of your pension. And currently they're doing a biannual valuation of the OPEB plan. So with that, they'll go in and look at the current census, they'll look at beneficiaries and see what that actual kind of experience has been versus expected, and they use the mortality tables and future projections. So all of those, um, those scenarios and assumptions are kind of baked into the baseline number that's there. It's just that for the, the reporting, they thought it would be useful for users to say how significant would these changes be? Are we really dependent on an aggressive selection of a metric here, which I would say yours aren't, um, but you know, how is that gonna change that number in the future? And, and if I can follow up with uh, two more questions. Um, since um, that time of this reporting, uh, there were some changes to the uh, retiree health care contribution uh, formula, the way that uh, the retirement board structured it. Um, has that been taken into account, or is that something to consider for next year's audit? Uh, I think Mr. Barron had uh, informed us of some of the changes that were being made. It would not be taken into account with the numbers as presented as of 2017, but it's something that the actuaries will have to take under advisement when they roll these numbers through for 2018 um, in, their, uh, in their calculations. All right, and then the other one is that, um, I believe it was sometime either last year or the end of the year before, there was a change to the um, pension calculation uh, to change the denominator from N over 60 to N over 80. Mm -hmm. um, has that been included as part of the actuarial report as well? Yeah, when they have a, a new class uh, mm -hmm. of that nature, all of that's considered in the background calculations that the actuarial firm does for the different classes. So that has been factored in as Yeah, well. because that's okay. done on an annual basis, that would all be considered through for their 17 valuation. Thank you. So what I'd like to, to do is take you back just a, a few slides in the presentation. I have a, a presentation that shows the county's fund balance um, for the prior uh, five years. So I'll try to get it up on the screen. Fund balance, five-year history, shows a line graph. So. One more, one more. No, nope, the other way. There you go. So that five-year history just shows a little bit of development over time, can be useful over time to view the county's financial position um, versus the financial statements show a point in time. But if we take a look over time, where the county's been from 2013 through 2015 and then through 2017, just to, in relation to some of the significant changes that have happened over time. Um, so what this slide presents is the orange line at the top is the total governmental funds balance. So that's all governmental funds. It includes health choices, children and youth, um, the Graysdale Fund, and the blue line at the bottom is the general fund balance over time. Uh, the next the next page has more detail on the general fund, but just to take a snapshot at that and kind of see over the five-year term um, kind of what has changed and what's increased. So we pointed out just a few um, major transactions of interest in those years that may have kind of characterized some of the trajectory of, of fund balance. Certainly there's a multitude of items, uh, transactions each year that characterize the, the total outcome. Um, but just to note, from 2016 to 2017, the increase in fund balance, general funds saw a $4.5 million increase in fund balance um, due to uh, pickup in real estate tax base and also cost containment in several areas. Health choices, the capitation payment that they're receiving is in excess of what the actuaries think that they'll have in claims. So that was a $1.8 million pickup. And also in Graysdale, um, they're in the second year of that um, uh, of the uh, intergovernmental transfer being back online. So they saw an increase of uh, about $500,000 due to that program uh, with the state. 
the next page. Oh. Yeah, uh, since we're on uh, the fund balance, uh, from uh, 2016 to 2017, it, it increased from 35.2 to 40.5%. Uh, typically, the recommendation is, is two months um, fund balance. Um, are we in excess of what's necessary there? Is, can you? Uh, you're on the slide with the fund balance. The fund balance, yes, the, the blue the yeah. line. Yeah, yeah, we're shown on the screen. This is just the general fund balance. Yeah. And what this shows is, um, as Mr. Cusick said, it's general fund balance as a percentage of the expenditures, your annual expenditures in the general fund. So it can be useful to see um, if you would interpret that, that percentage into a number of months. There's kind of a rule of thumb as far as how much or how many months of operating expenses you want to have kind of in fund balance to to kind of keep the county in, in a good uh, solvent and working capital position. So that has increased uh, over the last few years um, uh, for, the, for the general fund in 2017, ending at 40.5%. So that would translate to uh, probably about four to five months uh, of, uh, of total expenditures. I'll point out that um, the general fund is likely in future years to be the primary fund supporting the P3 program. So those capital expenditures in future years may be in excess of kind of what the requirements were for the program in 2017. So the kind of trajectory of that may not hold as, as it's been in the past as that cash kind of navigates to, to funding the P3 program. Um, but the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, has suggested a minimum of two months uh, is a good rule of thumb uh, for governments to have in, in uncommitted resources. So you are you are in excess of, of that rule of thumb. Um, so it's twice as much as what it needs to be. Yeah, and, and part so of that twice as much as what it needs to be by their standard. Well, that's a that's a that's a minimum. Yeah, that's a minimum suggestion. <laughs> 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 Uh, okay, okay. So, yeah, I see what you're saying. So, so it's, they're saying the recommended minimum is two months, and you're saying we're in four to five. Right yeah, well, and just to take us back, to, for those of you that weren't here, some of us thought that it was in excess, and that we could have reduced our tax rate. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't do so because there were uh, circumstances that were uh, inconvenient. Uh, but I believe the fund balance now is, is in excess of what it needs to be. We're, we're well in excess of that. <laughs> I think your point is well taken, Mr. Cusick. I don't know if heard it. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Uh, okay, if you want to continue, unless does anybody else have any questions? No. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, and just kind of on the horizon, um, certainly uh, management and, and council is well aware of of items rolling uh, from 2018 and beyond, but just a few things that we see and are discussed with our um, public sector base, future budgetary factors, um, the kind of climate in Washington in terms of the energy behind health care um, legislation, revamping anything there, we continue to keep a close eye on. Um, that recognition of the OPEB liability and what we talked about before is going to continue to bring to light health care costs in a very real and tangible way and how that's being managed either for current employees or for 
employees um, that are in a severance period and, and, and have those promised benefits. Uh, as Jill mentioned, kind of the state and condition of state, uh, of state and federal budgets in terms of uh, the continuity of funding. Uh, a couple years ago, with the state budget impasse, they weren't, you still had an appropriation of funds, but they weren't cash flowing it for a period of time, so it kind of extended the county's uh, resources until they got caught up. Uh, fiscal and legislative uh, updates, the county's nursing home, Graysdale, was a beneficiary of the, what they call the intergovernmental transfer, the IGT, which is a program that the state uh, put in place to kind of rebate some costs and increase the federal share of the medical assistance fund. So this is the second year through that you've really seen a bump in their operating results from Graysdale related, specifically related to uh, that IGT outcome. Also infrastructure and capital budget items, um, looking at the, the long-term lease that the county has with the human service building, if that were to be bought out in future years, commitment for the P3 bridge rehabilitation project, and also just general future infrastructure spending. Um, for the, the county, uh, county's primary assets. Also in future years, keeping an eye on the pension and OPEB. And we talked a lot, a lot about the fancy math and accounting that's going to affect this in the future, but also just on a budgetary basis, um, continuing to, to uh, appropriate and fund those uh, periodic contributions to both of those plans to manage the liability. Well, while we're on that page, yes, sir. Can, can I, one question, and, and I'm new, six months in. Um, the P3 project, okay, um, I, I just have, a, I, you know, my concern with that and, you know, I know he mentioned about, you know, the reserve or whatever, if the project's done and, you know, we, what, what if there's something left? Is that a county liability? They, they, there's a certain deal here, right, where they have to pay so much money and they do so much work, all right? And I, I don't know if you're the person to ask this question to, I'm, I'm sure you are. If they don't finish the project, okay, we still have to pay them the money, right? And then what happens if the bridges aren't done? Is that going to be on us? And the question is, um, you know, it, what if that happens? Are you asking from like a financial standpoint? Yeah, what yeah. Yeah, and we're I talking mean, about reserve, and we're talking it, about different things. Yeah, and, if you and, would I, have, and, I, and it's on this page here. I thought of it. It's worth sure. to no, talk and about. it's something to consider. Um, I'll point out that footnote 16 to the financial statements includes some uh, lengthy narrative about that contract itself in terms of what the GPA is into and the county's guarantee of that. And it also shows in dollars and cents basically what the future commitment is to, to cash flow that in the future. And, and we thought it important to include that table because it's a commitment in future years. Um, now, as far as if there would be a contractual dispute in the future, if the counterparty wasn't able to complete the milestone objectives, there's qualitative measures they have to meet in order to have those paid. So that would be a matter for, for the We engineer, hope it all works out in the way it's supposed to, but. So uh, funds not. don't get sorry. So funds don't get dispersed unless the work is up to the the benchmarks that they're supposed to meet, the milestones. Yeah, in, in the contract there's milestone payments that are scheduled, but they're also contingent on certain uh, qualitative items being done, the engineering being done for a certain number of bridges. Um, and there's a third there's a third party engineer involved that is no, in, in nobody's interest that, that um, specific interest that reviews that some of that information. So. Right. So no bridge shouldn't get done if if the money hasn't been dispersed, right? I mean, the bridges, the work should be done if the money's being dispersed. I don't think he's. I don't, yes. Allegedly. Yes. Yes. I'm not okay. sure I can comment yeah. on that, but I mean, the, no. the well, all of a sudden, this seemed like a big deal. Like somehow we should put like a cushion of some sort in just in case we have to make a commitment that we don't necessarily have. I think I, that's I just, what you were getting. I, at. I'm, I'm kind of concerned that I just don't know because it's something different that yeah, we've never done before. Like that, this, this is something that we've talked about that we, we, we've gotten. Um, but from, from your standpoint, and I, I'm going to try and get this into the council thing, they're giving us an audit based on, on our financial responsibilities, and they are accounting for this, uh, commitment. this commitment. Whether or not how the commitment plays out or doesn't play out in terms of actual structures or in terms of, of completion, that's not really their their assessment is going to remain the same regardless that that we have this outstanding i think what we're getting into now and this is just my opinion and i'd be happy to be 
uh, corrected, is, is the legality of whether or not things, the actual contract is, is fulfilled or whatnot. So that discussion isn't necessary here, that's what you're saying? Well, I, I don't know if they can, I mean, I think they've said that we, we're going to carry the liability. Uh, we're, uh, they've accounted they're, for they're it. They're marrying in, in their, their As far as the actual performance. Oh, yeah, we'll cross that bridge. Yeah, I don't know. Lori, did you have something you wanted to? Well, not specific to that, but in res with respect to um, P3 and the whole GPA situation, there has been some conversation about possibly bringing the funding structure back into the county. So I don't know if based on what you experienced this year, if you have any recommendations to that end, if you have seen anything like this in any other form in any other county. So do you have any thoughts about that? Would it be more helpful to have it under the county structure so that everything's in line? Because it is a unique animal. Yes, it certainly is. <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Oh, your question. Sure. But just to kind of go back to the, the payment schedule, you know, as Nick had said, there are these these milestone payments. The mean, benchmark as, as of now, you know, you're you're making these these payments, um, which really aren't um, they're they're set in the contracts, but they're not necessarily tied to what what work is complete. So if they you know have done more work than has been paid for, then we would set up a liability. So at the end of four years. That's obviously in your perfect scenario. In your question, you know, what if what if we get two years down the road and we paid out this money and half of the project is not done at that point? Where are we at? And I mean, I think at that point, and you've kind of alluded to that. I think it becomes a legal issue at yeah. that point because these contractors should be bonded, so there should be you know you should be able to you know say, well, hey, we paid you twenty million and if you only finished eighteen of it. So you know, as the process goes along. know what is happening if you know the engineering costs haven't been done on these ten bridges but we're gonna bill you for them obviously you know it may not have been done. So I think what you're finding out is this is a, a new and even for the seasoned council members, this is a new animal, if you will. And and I think everybody's trying to understand it and I think we all it's um there's the performance of what has been said will be done, but from your end, you're, you're looking at things as, oh, okay, this is on paper what's supposed to happen financially, and that's how we're doing it. Now, if something changes financially in 2018, uh, or, you know, we're, we're going to have to, we'll factor that in when we do the next report or, or the next year after that. But for now, you're looking at it as, okay, here are the milestones. Here's what the county's going to be doing in A, B, C, D, and E. So when, if we get anywhere beyond that, that's sort of out of your scope, uh, your realm of what, I mean, you can give an opinion, but it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily relevant to your report. Right, I mean, it becomes a legal issue. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> you, you, you joined the test tube group. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I don't know. I didn't want to...
if anybody My has job. anything, otherwise, please. Continue. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and just to wrap up quickly with the presentation. Yes. We did talk about the OPEB before, but just to uh, kind of go over, we talk about uh, in the financial statements what the contributions have been over the past number of years to the OPEB. Um, the county has shown that discipline internally to budget and make the minimum required annual contribution. So you can see over the past um, six years that are presented here, you've contributed 100% of what the actuaries recommended that you contribute in those years. And that's really what's taken you to the slide that we saw earlier on the next page, which shows you sitting with a trust fund of about $40 million of assets that are, have a return on those, certainly a very strong return in 2017. Um, that are, um, is generating income to pay those benefits in future years, um, unlike some of the other comparative counties um, uh, with the same sorts of arrangements. Just a quick update. There's a few changes that are coming um, that we might want to be mindful of in future years. I mentioned before this total OPEB uh, scenario that we talked about next year, that liability, what the actuaries, how they get it situated for 2018, will be up to their math, but we're going to bring that liability onto the books for 2018, so that'll be a, a net draw on your net position. Your equity position will bring that down a bit. It's going to be shared by all of your uh, other folks in the public sector that also have OPEB obligations. You're not alone in that. Um, in future years, uh, GASB, who's the, the organization that sets the accounting rules for governments like yourself, they're tinkering with some of what they, uh, how they want to capture and present information related to fiduciary activities, which could include the pension and OPEB funds and agency funds in the financial statements. Also how leases, um, either operating leases or capital leases are treated in the financial statements. And they also have a few other projects going on, so we'll make sure to keep management and council involved with those changes. As much as we've talked about the OPEB changes, we'll make sure you're apprised of other changes in the years uh, when they're upcoming. And that concludes most of our presentation. Welcome any further questions on the audit report or the presentation uh, materials. Questions I, I would just ask if you could maybe uh, gloss over the letter that you had sent to us, if there's anything you wanted to point out there. I read through it. And um, if there was anything you would want to add to the, um, the letter. Yes, and we do have uh, copies of that. It was distributed in electronic format earlier. Um, I think we I have, have copies. We do have copies. Uh, Does anybody need a copy right now? I'll um, take one. I'm sitting here. She's Thank you. And also, Linda, we have the extra copies if you'd like to take those. So this document uh, contains, uh, in total, um, just our what we've talked about uh, as a part of this. It just it formalizes. It just formalizes what we've talked about before. No significant difficulties with management. We're not aware of any fraud or illegal acts, anything like that that has to be talked about. Um, and discharges our requirement for formal communication. A few pages in, if you skip through two pages, you'll get to what we call our internal controller management letter. Mm -hmm. And that's the letter that contains the description of that material weakness, the segregation of duties, um, will be shown on that. Uh, schedule. So we just describe kind of overall what the nature of the relationship is with the GPA and the county, how they're separately governed and managed, and how their lack of uh, uh, segregation of duties, checks and balances in place leads to that condition that's being reported for the audit. The other items that are presented uh, in that uh, in that same letter are items that we are just communicating uh, for internal um, consideration and improvement of, of practices. It's something that we don't think is very severe and doesn't warrant um, classification as what we call a significant deficiency or a material weakness, which are more severe conditions. So with the, in the pension plan, we go through and do our detailed testing of participants and census information. We saw in a few cases where some voluntary contributions didn't come online early enough for those participants, so we recommended that that be rectified and revisit those policies um, and practices internally. And also with fixed assets, capital assets, and the county-owned assets are uh, tracked very intensively. Um, by the county's fiscal department, and every year they go through a process to identify which of those are going to be capitalized and depreciated over a long-term period. Um, 
in that process, we recommend that they uh, put in place a formalized process to look for assets that may be disposed, um, county-owned assets that are being disposed and should be taken off the books. So there's policies and procedures in place to make sure things like vehicles are properly handled and they're sold in the proper ways, but there can be other smaller types of assets that the county has accumulated over time that they may have scrapped or they may, uh, may no longer be in service, so we recommend that they just do a survey to, to find that stuff and, and write it off, basically, if needed. Um, so. Yeah, just to follow up then, uh, the uh, pension contribution issue, um, has that been addressed by HR and or payroll? Are we aware of this? I assume that's who would have to address it, payroll and the administration. Uh. Yeah, these, these findings were originally found by the controller's office, uh, oh. staff during their work, um, and we retest some of what they do and do a separate sample. I don't know specifically if the two, two or three items issued or mentioned here were rectified, but they were communicated back to the appropriate parties. Um, Did the controller come to us with uh, I that? I don't that. recall that. Might be. Yeah. Go ahead. Mr. Right. always right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> open invitation. Um, those from the controller's office would go to RKL for a report. Um, and for the voluntary contributions that you asked about, um, that they were not deferred. That resolves in the fiscal department um, with regard to um, how we handle um, the, the voluntary contributions. So there, that's going to be worked on and it's already been corrected as far as I know. Okay. All right. I think that's probably it then. Uh, thank you very much presentation. Uh, <coughs> just very quickly while they're still here. Uh, I, I just, you don't know this, so I want to tell you. Okay. When Nick and Jill and Steve and Mary Alice and Duran and Bryce started to, uh, the process of trying to understand how to get the P3 incorporated into our financial statements, what Mr. Barron told me was the initial thought was there is no way to do it. These folks work together and came up with a, br it's, it's not simply just adding columns. They came up in the, the, with a brilliant solution because, you know, as we know, to our chagrin, this is the first of its kind uh, thing at the county level. And they were absolutely, they worked very hard on it. Uh, some might conclude, well, that's what they're paid for. No, that, that's not really what they were paid for. And Deb from uh, Riley, the GPA's auditor, was also tremendous in this process. So I just wanted, before they left, I wanted to let you know that your auditors worked with your fiscal staff, who were tremendous in this process, and went above and beyond getting our books right. Our books are right because these folks did such tremendous work. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think going forward, and you saw that there, there's a great deal of concern. I mean, uh, we're not going to get into the should or shouldn't have with the GPA, but from a financial standpoint, which is you're here for us, I think we all would like to going forward, and we'll be talking to new GPA members. I'm glad that you were able to get together and work this out. I think it makes us all feel a little better sitting up here if, if we sort of get a sense there's a collective understanding of what's going on. Did you have something? Yeah, I would, I would just say thank you very much. It was a good presentation, and uh, you know, you can always market what you did with the P3 and get a, get a patent for it and take yourself on the road. Just don't want to, we don't want to partner no, with you, that's all. That's, that's what Nick and I are going to have a, a road That's how show. we got here. But thank you. We, we appreciate your business, and I, I want to um, echo what my mom said. I mean, the, everyone has been very, uh, very helpful with us because it was, you know, we were uh, trudging through new waters. So we had a we had a lot of phone calls on this and everyone worked well together. So uh, thank you. We, we appreciate uh, your business and um, thanks for having us today. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, now we're going to roll along and we have a uh, review of donations. And as you know, part of the county council's responsibility or duty is we are the ones who accept donations. Uh, on behalf of the county. The first one is the K-9 uh, that we talked about, and I believe that, um, here we are. Um, so 
I'll go to the second. Whereas Northampton County received an anonymous donation of a canine narcotics dog valued at $15,000 in payment for the first round of training, training valued at $3,000 used by the Department of Corrections. There is now therefore be it resolved that the Northampton County Council that it does hereby accept the donation of the canine narcotics dog in its first round of training. Uh, yeah. motion, motion to move yeah. uh, forward with a positive recommendation okay. for tomorrow. Does anybody have any questions? You have no. I think he's spoken a few times about this. And unless sure. anyone has any questions, then we'll move ahead. No, I think we're good. Don't really All right, we'll move that ahead to tomorrow. The next one is the uh, uh, Department of Human Services, Gracedale Marine Corps League. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to go to the second again. Whereas in Northampton County, Detachment Marine Corps League is donating $1,000 to Graysdale to be divided evenly, distributed, and deposited into the personal fund account of each Graysdale resident who is a veteran. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Northampton County Council that does hereby accept the donation of $1,000 on behalf of the Graysdale residents who are veterans. Um, I, I, I make a motion that we recommend approval for full council and we send a letter of thanks uh, if it uh, passes as we expect tomorrow. I'm sure. I don't know if anyone's here on it regarding it, but I agree. I think it's great. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll move that forward for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And now we're down to the review of the general purpose authority. Oh, did I say The general purpose authority Lafayette College project. Okay. And I think we have Mr. Hughes here. You may want to say a word or two. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Hughes from DCED. DCED and the General Purpose Authority would request uh, the committee's approval to pass through to the full council a health, safety, and welfare uh, resolution in support of a $22 million bond to support Lafayette College. The actual bond is for a refinance of a bond that was issued in 2008. Um, Craig Becker is here to answer any questions. Um, you know, everyone has the resolution. Now, I, I, I the, the, we do have a GPA now, obviously. I was here, we didn't have a GPA. So what we would have done is we would have gotten this and the council would have either done the high, we did the higher authority, we did the, 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 the hospitals and so on and so forth. Um, but apparently now, even though the GPA does it, the county council, even though we still have to as an elected body, give our stamp of uh, our imprimatur and then we, they pass it on to them. Um, I know I can say with my own knowledge that we don't assume any risk or financial liability with any of this. So if anyone has any, if you want to make a statement or anyone has any questions, I'll open it up. Past practice. But yeah, I mean, do you have anything? You want uh, just to one thing to note, uh, these bonds are from the Higher uh, Education Authority, which, again, I've called it a zombie authority, and I think we need to, to look, we, we do need to look into um, dissolving it uh, whenever, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, and then the other question I had is that I noticed that it says, uh, for Part F, it says, the funding of a portion of the cost of the acquisition of certain real estate in the city of Easton. Um, it, it's my understanding that there's uh, some litigation or ongoing zoning issues uh, with regard to some of those projects. Um, uh, would this be related to that? And is there a potential for litigation um, that would prevent that from happening? Uh, these bonds refinance uh, the 2008 series. Uh, that did finance the acquisition of some properties. I believe that was uh, the Grossman House at 5, 611 High Street, and I think that's not in the zone that we're talking about for the future housing. Okay, so there's nothing, nothing new in, in here that's new that relates to the, the proposed there's, project. Yeah, this is that's all refinancing of prior bonds. There's no new money issued here. Okay. I think uh, Ms. Hefner wanted to either make a comment or ask Well, I, I just support this. We supported it at the GPA meeting, and I think Mr. Hughes can speak to the rogue authorities after we well, discuss this issue. Um, all right. Well, then I, I like the... I, zombie rogue, whatever. Well, that's Mr. Kusick's <laughs> area of expertise. He's got zombies on the brain. <laughs> I'll, I'll move to recommend to full council for approval tomorrow night. Uh, 
Okay, I, I agree. I'll move it on. Uh, is there anything, Mr. Hughes? I, otherwise, I'm going to adjourn. If you didn't have anything else to add, you'll be here tomorrow. I just thought there were two items. One is if you wanted to talk about the authority, um, uh, the two authority, because that was a question brought up and we brought it up right. in the GPA. Second is I don't know where we're supposed to bring up. There has been question about whether we um, start to look at pulling some of the GPA financing in under the county umbrella. So I don't know if that's I, something that personally, Mr. I think McClure if discusses, if that's a motion that gets, and I don't know if this is the committee to recommend. I would that. prefer the entire council. All right, just trying to figure I mean, out who it, goes I, with what. We'll do it. I, I don't know if how you feel. I would personally, I think the entire county council, if there's things changing with the GPA, we might want to hold that to the meeting. If there's a general question regarding what's going forward rather than address it now at a committee. You want your question answered? I, I would prefer we answer it in a committee rather than. All right. A, um, <coughs> it's a, more okay. of a finance issue, I believe, moving Thank forward. You, Mr. Kraft isn't here to throw something at you, so I'm okay with it. Go <laughs> ahead, Mr. Hughes. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> so we made an offer to the GPA. It was a very extensive written offer um, for the GPA to consider. Once we bring the GPA financials in, there are some things to recapture. We will come up with a plan and suggest a plan to the GPA for their ratification, hopefully ending some of these zombie authorities. Um, you'll remember that your auditors mentioned there are money in receivables that are now out there. We will reclaim those receivables and sort of reset everything to zero. I think that will make Deb very happy from Riley and Company, who will still remain their external auditors. Um, but it will reduce fees. There were fees that had to be paid to RKL to do this work. Um, so county council had to pay a bill. Um, on top of that, um, there, uh, uh, Deb Borger um, also had to extend additional fees to um, the GPA. Um, and there was some discussion that the count it was the county's fault and they would have to pay that bill. Um, that was stated in a meeting, I believe, by Mr. Langan. Um, and the, the money was ultimately paid by the GPA, um, but we also, we, ha we did have to hire um, a, an individual to do a, a, another check, and the county did agree to pay the bill for that, simply because we needed to get our financial statements moving along as the GPA was a blended component unit. So right off the bat, we're gonna do it for free, and on top of it, it will save the county at least $10,000. One comment, and I and I and Steve knows I totally support what they've offered. There's no question about that. But because of the interim status of the changeover and all the members of the GPA, that's why it kind of got lost in the shuffle and really never came to a vote. I think the new board, obviously, I think is totally supportive of it. So just as a clarification, and the other two authorities, the higher education, um, and the hospital authority, they are inactive relative to the state. And we have talked in the past that there needs to be some resolution relative to those authorities, because the one authority still does have a deposit account, which is like two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. And that could be brought into the that GPA be, as part ahead. of a consolidation. Yes. Right. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I look forward to. So it's in the works. Well, it's good in the works. That's, no, I, that's a great way to put it. It's in the works. Positive. Thank, um, thank you, Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Barron. If there's no other any other new business for the committee. If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So be it.